there's been a lot of great research in the last 30, 40 years in this particular area. And we basically now know there is a right way to negotiate and there is a wrong way to negotiate. And I'm gonna to try to empower you uh, this afternoon, not only with the knowledge of the right way to negotiate, but also to try to help us understand so when we actually go back onto the front lines, which is where you negotiate every day, you can actually put these strategies into practice within the context of a process that has an almost unlimited number of variables floating around at any given point in time. We tend to negotiate instinctively or intuitively. We tend to sort of do it off the cuff, and we really don't spend the time and the effort that we should focusing on the process. Instead, we focus almost exclusively on the substance. Okay, so first thing you wanna do in any negotiation, first thing you wanna do in every negotiation, first thing we did in the context of the car repair negotiation is recognize and understand that first golden rule, information is power, so get it. Within that context, you wanna get information to set your goals. In any negotiation, you first wanna find sufficient information to determine your goals, then you wanna design a strategy to accomplish it. You cannot, you cannot, Negotiate strategically based on the expert's proven research if you don't know where you want to be at the end of the day. You need to figure out at the beginning of the day where you want to be at the end of the day in order to design a strategic way to get there. Now, some of you may say, well, Marty, of course you want to set our goals. This is basic. This is straightforward. This is negotiation 101. Tell me something I don't know. Well, I would suggest to you that this strategy, in fact, many of the strategies and tactics we're going to talk about this afternoon, these are not difficult for you to intellectually understand. In fact, many of you are gonna say, oh yeah, I've done that, or I've seen someone do that. The challenge in the negotiation process, the challenge in the negotiation process is oftentimes not just knowing what to do, not just intellectually understanding what to do, but as I mentioned before, actually being able to implement these strategies and tactics within the context of a process that has an almost unlimited number of variables floating around. It's relatively easy for me to stand up here and to say this is what you should do. It's far more difficult for you on the front lines to actually put those strategies into practice. Let me give you an example from the business arena on how it's relatively easy for us to talk about it, but sometimes exceedingly difficult to actually implement. 1955, Akia Morita, one of the founders of Sony Corporation, had an opportunity to sell 100,000 transistor radios here in the United States for $29.95 through Bolivar. And in 1955, uh, Sony was virtually unknown outside of Japan, and Bulova had an extensive retail distribution network, had an extensive reputation, and the deal was that Sony would take this new innovative electronics product, this transistor radio, they'd sell it to Bulova, Bulova, which had the reputation, which had the retail distribution network, of course, would stamp the Bulova name on it and distribute it throughout the United States. This was a huge deal for Sony. In fact, it was worth several times Sony's working capital from the previous few years. So Marita goes to Sony's board and basically said, should we do the deal? And Sony's board said, absolutely do the deal. It is a win-win deal. Raise your hands if you've ever heard to use the terms win-win. Personally, I'm sick of those terms. The reason I'm sick of those terms is that people use the terms win-win these days to describe every single deal they do. Now obviously, if you use it to describe every single deal, it's completely lost any of its traditional meaning. Traditionally, what win-win meant was the way in which we actually engage in this process adds value for you and it adds value for us. And that's basically what Sony's board told them read. It takes advantage of our strength, this innovative new electronics product, takes advantage of Bulova's strength, the reputation, the retail distribution network. We'll sell it to Bulova, stamp the Bulova name on it, distribute it throughout the United States. Sony's board told Marita, do the deal. Well, Marita took about two weeks to think about it. He then rejected the deal with Bulova against the advice of his board. Any idea why he would reject the deal with Bulova against the advice of his board? That's exactly right. It doesn't promote the name of Sony. Because Marita's long-term strategic goal was not just to exponentially increase his profits over the next two, three, five years. It was over the next 50 years to get the Sony brand name out there as consistent and synonymous with innovative new electronics products. He rejects the deal with Bulova. He goes with a smaller distributor. They stamp the Sony name on that transistor radio, and of course, the rest is business history. Marita said that was the quote-unquote best business decision that he ever made. 
and yet it's a fundamental point, easy to understand intellectually, difficult sometimes to actually put into practice. You need to know at the beginning of the process where you want to be at the end of the process in order to design a strategic way to get there. Here's a quick uh, tip and tactic uh, to help you in your goal setting. You want to expect to succeed. A passionate, positive attitude makes a difference. Raise your hands if you've ever heard a motivational speaker. I'll bet every motivational speaker you've ever heard said some variation of the following. And I heard this from a motivational speaker in Vancouver a few years ago. Here's what he told us. Every morning when you wake up, I want you to look at yourself in the mirror and say, I feel great today. Just like Tony the Tiger. I feel great today and this is going to be a fantastic day. And he said, I want you to make that statement every single day. I don't care if you've got a horrible headache. I don't care if it's storming outside. I don't care if this is going to be the worst day in your life. He said, I want you to look at yourself in the mirror and say, I feel great today. And the reason he said that, and the reason I'll bet every motivational speaker said some variation of that, is that they know and the research supports your attitude. Your attitude going into the negotiation changes the way you come across. If you go into a negotiation saying, we deserve to achieve X, your body language will be different, your eye contact will be different, your whole persona and way of coming across and words you choose will increase your likelihood of achieving your goals. Now look, I'm a practical person. I did not wake up this morning, look at myself in the mirror and say, I feel great today. Frankly, I think that's a little bit hokey. By the way, that's a legal term. <laughs> question is, do I psych myself up before certain significant negotiations? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because it makes a concrete practical difference in how you come across. You also want to commit to your goals in writing. You don't just want to think about your goals. You literally physically want to write it down. Put it on a piece of paper. Put it on a post-it note by your computer. Put it in an email to your boss. Or, better yet, and this is going to be a theme we're going to talk about for the next hour or so, that goal is gonna be the first element that I'm gonna recommend you include in what we're gonna call your strategic negotiation plan. If you are truly committed to becoming a more effective, a more strategic negotiator based on the expert's proven research, you need to do more with the stuff we talked about this afternoon than just remember it. You need to do more than be able to regurgitate it in two weeks on a test. You actually need to implement it. And the only way, the only way that I and many of my colleagues have found that will increase your likelihood over the long term of putting this into practice is if you actually sit down before you engage and develop a strategic negotiation plan. Now, I'm gonna give you the elements that you're gonna to want to include in those plans, but that's really the only way at the end of the day that long term you're gonna change your behavior. But you know what, you don't have to take my word for it. A couple years ago, I led a seminar in Phoenix. I had a panel of experts in that seminar from the business arena, from the legal arena, from the political arena. And I asked each one of my experts, I said, share with us the most effective negotiation strategy you have ever used and an instance in which you used it. And we're now gonna listen to a video clip from Mal Joseph. Mal Joseph is the former chairman and CEO of the Dial Corporation, multi-billion dollar multinational consumer products company. And he's going to share with us what he has found to be his most effective negotiation strategy. Obviously, it relates to writing down your goals. The thing I always try to keep in mind in any negotiation is to know what I want at the end of it. And I always make a practice of writing it down. What is victory for me? And then I set up a series of stages as the negotiations unfold, and I always consult with the with the legal team to be sure that the steps and maneuvers and motions and practices are consistent with getting us to that end line. I've seen more bad negotiations simply because the client or the side, side A or side B really forgets what it is they wanted to achieve in the end. So staying focused is the best thing we can do. One quick example of years ago, I negotiated the uh, <coughs> Uh, movement of a drug uh, from prescription status to OTC status, it became a leave, the uh, pain reliever that sold over the counter today. And the negotiations took 15 months. So my little chart 
uh, grew into many, many volumes of twists and turns and legal considerations in a very, very complicated negotiation with the FDA and with a, a, another manufacturing company. And it taught me uh, early on then that uh, if, if you don't have in front of your eyes, uh, each time you, you address the subject, exactly what you were trying to achieve, you will get less than what you're after. Okay, so what's Mal Joseph talking about? Not only do you want to think about your goals, you literally physically want to write it down. Put it on a piece of paper, shoot an email to your colleague, or better yet, as I said before, that's going to be the first element that I'm going to recommend you include in what we're going to call your strategic negotiation plan. Of course, you also want to develop an information bargaining strategy. How do you get information? What kind of information do you want to share? Obvious point. The more you learn about what both sides have or will agree to, the better you're going to do. What kind of information do you want to get? You want to get substantive information. Facts, interests, options. What's the difference between an interest and a position? What's the difference between an interest and a position? Here's how I like to think about them. A position is what you want, and interest is why you want it. A position is what you want, and interest is why you want it. It's the next level of information exchange. It's sometimes what I think about as the hidden agenda, the driving force, the pain point uh, that's, uh, that's really underlying what's going on in the negotiation. Uh, let me give you an example. Uh, a couple years ago, I don't practice law anymore, but I do work on deals. And I was helping this guy sell uh, a uh, chain of medical clinics in Texas. Uh, and um, his interest, or, or you know, he was, I was working with an investment banker on the deal, uh, and we kept asking this, this guy, you know, what's, what's, your, what's your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? And he kept giving us uh, a number, let's just call it $25 million. He wanted to sell his business for $25 million. We kept saying, why? What's really driving this, 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 this idea that you have in mind that you have to give 25, you have to get 25 million? Well, one night we were out to dinner and we were having a, a couple of drinks, sometimes a good information gathering tactic. <laughs> uh, and, um, and, and we were just having this conversation and it finally came out the reason why it was so important for him to get 25 million. It's because his brother, a few years before, had sold his company for just under 25 million. <laughs> it was all about sibling rivalry. It was all about bragging rights uh, at family gatherings. Now you say, you know what, Marty, that's, that's illegitimate. That's not, that's not right. That's not, that's not really helpful. But you know what? It was driving the process from his perspective. Or how many of you deal with people that, that have egos? Right? Ego is an interest. Now, they're not usually going to come right out and say, uh, we need to beat you, or we need you to feel like we won, but they're, it's going to be driving it's going to be driving their behavior. And to the extent that you can find that out, oftentimes that's crucial. So one of the questions up here, for instance, was how do you deal with, uh, with bullies? How do you neutralize bullies? A great example uh, came from Steven Spielberg, the movie, movie director. So uh, he actually grew up in Phoenix. And when he was about 13 years old, he was dealing with this bully uh, that was doing, you know, what bullies do, beating him up, making fun of him. Uh, you know the drill. And so what does Steven Spielberg do? 13 years old, he makes a movie. Makes a movie about World War II. Any idea what he does with the bully in the movie? He gives him a starring role. Now, let's think about it. He's doing a movie about World War II. What role do you think he gave the bully? Not Hitler, but close. What do bullies crave more than anything? It's not their position, but it's their interest. What do they crave more than anything? That's right, attention and the perception of power. So what does he do? He offers the bully the, the role of a Nazi stormtrooper. He found an artificial environment in which to give the bully what the bully really craved more than anything. And it was actually a role that satisfied Steven Spielberg's interests as well. My understanding is they actually became friends 
throughout high school. Or you ask the question about salary negotiations. Sometimes they think about salary negotiations as solely involving money and compensation. And maybe sometimes that is what our position is. But oftentimes what's more important than money? Maybe it's recognition. Uh, maybe it's time off. Maybe it's flexible, uh, flexible pay. Uh, or flexible time, or the opportunity to work in an environment uh, where you feel more valued, or you have more administrative support that helps you do your job, that changes the quality of your life, right? It's these, these next level of information exchange. It's not just what they want, it's why they want it. By the way, this is another one of those areas where it's relatively easy to talk about, but it's sometimes exceedingly difficult to actually find out, because sometimes they're not gonna wanna share that information. But you really, and we're gonna talk in a second about how to get that, but you really need to at least, at the very least, recognize not only what they want, but why they want it. You also wanna get strategic intelligence. Investigate their reputation and past tactics. When I talk about strategic intelligence, I'm not just talking about finding out if someone as bright, as honest, as trustworthy. I'm talking about the next level of information exchange. I'm talking about the fact that, uh, um, what was your name again? Matt. Matt. Now, I don't know how many of you know Matt or know Matt well, but Matt, for those of you who don't know, is your classic walkout artist in most negotiations, right? I mean, nine times out of 10, he takes his papers, he throws them into his briefcase, he takes his team, he storms out toward the elevator, and 95% of the time, Matt, back at the table within 24 hours. Classic walkout artist. Now, is that important information for you to know about Matt before you pick up the telephone, before you engage? It's absolutely critical. Because then all of a sudden, he takes, his brief, he takes his papers, he throws them into his briefcase, he takes his team, he storms out toward the elevator. If you know that's a classic Matt move, how are you gonna act and react? I'll see you in about 10 minutes. <laughs> but if you didn't do your strategic homework, you didn't do your strategic due diligence, you might be thinking, hey, this deal's going down the tubes. We need to do something to bring him back to the table. Now look, Matt does not advertise the fact that he's a walkout artist. Not on his LinkedIn profile, not on his Facebook page. Don't even know if you have those. If you do, I guarantee you it's not there. You're going to have to do your homework. You're going to have to talk to people who have negotiated with him before. By the way, obviously I completely made that up about Matt. <laughs> I, I don't want you after today to get a reputation as a walkout artist unless you want to. So how do you get this information? How do you get this information? Number one, you've got to ask. Effective negotiators ask at least two times more questions than others. Folks, that is an incredible statistic. Effective negotiators ask at least two times more questions than others. Raise your hands if you negotiate over the telephone. Let's say you're sitting at your desk, telephone rings. It's your counterpart in the negotiation. If you look at the caller ID. Before you say a word, before you say a word, who has a strategic advantage? The caller, no matter how bright you are, no matter how good you are on your feet, you're probably not thinking strategically about that call, that conversation, that negotiation at that exact moment in time. And chances are, they've spent a little bit of time thinking about what they want to accomplish in that telephone call. Here's my recommended response almost every time. I'm right in the middle of something, can I call you back? Now, 100% of the time, that is an accurate, truthful response. You might be right in the middle of daydreaming. <laughs> Accurate, truthful response. Chances are that person calling also has thought about what questions they want to ask. Effective negotiators ask at least two times more questions than others. If you give me on the one hand a very, very bright, intelligent, convincing, persuasive negotiator who is not a particularly effective questioner and listener, and on the other hand you give me an equally bright and intelligent negotiator who is not as persuasive, not as convincing, just as bright, but is a more effective questioner and listener. Nine times out of 10, the more effective questioner and listener will be the more effective negotiator. Negotiation power goes to those who ask and listen, not those who argue and persuade. Negotiation power goes to those who ask and listen, not those who argue and persuade. Reflect back on your last significant negotiation. 
Who asked more question? Who was, who was in more information gathering mode? One of the questions up here said, you had an information disadvantage. You need to think about that going in. What kind of questions do you wanna ask? What information do you wanna find out? Now I'm a list person. So I go into a negotiation oftentimes with a list of information I wanna find out. And sometimes during a break in a negotiation, I look at that list. And I say, you know what, I asked that question, they didn't answer it. Sometimes the most important thing you can find out in a negotiation is what they didn't answer. When they avoided answering a question. That means you not only have to actively listen, but you need to really deeply listen and understand and focus on what they're saying and what they're not saying. You also want to employ the power of silence. For those of you who negotiate over the telephone, this works even more effectively over the phone. By the way, what do you think I mean when I say employ the power of silence? I have a feeling we could do this for a little while. <laughs> That's exactly right. Who he, he who talks first oftentimes loses. For whatever reason, we tend to be uncomfortable with silence. So what do we do? We oftentimes fill it. We oftentimes fill it with information that has a strategic value to the other side. Now we need to be a little bit careful about this because sometimes uh, it's okay to create that environment, but at least be aware that that's the potential. By the way, anybody want to guess the longest period of extended silence in a significant international negotiation where the parties literally were sitting across the table from each other, staring at each other for this period of time without a break? Anybody want to guess how long that lasted? Just take a guess. Two hours, Two hours higher. 13 hours? <laughs> Actually, that's pretty close. 11 hours. 11 hours, they just stared at each other. North Korea, South Korea, 1969. 11 hours. Any quick, uh, quick comment strip that illustrates some of these points? Margaret comes in, look, Dennis, I hit the jackpot. You sure did. He looks at this chocolate Easter bunny. Want to trade? Dream on, she says. You're not going to eat that whole thing, are you? That was the idea. Do you know how many calories that'll be? Well, I haven't done the math yet, but and what if it melts all over your new Easter dress? Or you might get a stomachache and miss school tomorrow. There goes your perfect attendance record, like taking candy from a baby. He focused in on the interests, knew what her interests were, and illustrated how it wasn't in her interest to actually keep what he wanted to get in the first place. Mm -hmm.